Well, 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 hallelujah, glory to God for this fantastic day. Listen, I am your host, Andrew Crawley, and I want to welcome you to this edition of The Kingdom's Perspective. Listen, I want to go ahead and encourage you before we start today, go and visit our YouTube channel. Type in my name, Andrew Crawley, click there on YouTube. We have many ministry there for you and for your viewing pleasure. Share it with some friends, with some family members, with a co-worker, and hopefully and prayerfully it'll be a blessing to you. Amen. Well, listen, I want to tell you guys, I am very, very excited about today, and I definitely don't take today lightly, and you shouldn't either. And the reason for that is because I have beside me Bishop George, the one and only Bishop George Brooks. Bishop Brooks, an honor for you to be on our show, sir. Our pleasure, sir. God is awesome. He's good and he's faithful. And so uh, I'm just honored to be here today. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your presence. Y'all know he definitely graced us with his presence. Uh, here on the Kingdom's Perspective, and we are definitely excited. You know, we've had some men of God in the past, and he is definitely a spiritual pioneer. He has been on the forefront, especially here in this region in the Triad area and here in the North Carolina area. And so we are definitely indeed excited to have him today and with the wisdom that he is going to bring. I know I'm encouraged because some leader today is definitely going to be encouraged. Some leader today, whether it be past, present, or future, you're going to be encouraged. You're going to look at some things. There are going to be some key things in ministry. Uh, Bishop has already been talking to me about some things that's in his heart that totally lines up with our vein of ministry here and I'm I'm just excited just to dive right on in and let this great man of God minister to your hearts today. Amen. Amen. Well first, Bishop Brooks, if you would, sir, could you just share with us, just, just give us a, a brief synopsis of just your experience in ministry. Would you do that for us? It'll be my pleasure, sir. Well, Quite candidly, I started in 1975. Wow. Uh, it was really kind of a whirlwind introduction. Um, I got up uh, one Sunday morning. I'd asked my church to pray for me. I was a manager, and I'd got, I asked my church to pray for me So because we had to lay some people off, and I knew it was going to affect yes, their lives. And so uh, what happened was I got up, and uh, the Holy Spirit started moving me in, and I just said, you know, the Lord has called me to preach. Well, that very day, my pastor, who was my uncle, had a heart attack. Yes, sir. Uh, and in so doing, uh, he was incapacitated. And uh, so uh, three months later, uh, he licensed me. And uh, three months after that, in order to help him at the church, he ordained me. Mm -hmm. uh, and roughly five months after that, I was pastoring at Mount Zion. Wow. So all within a whirlwind of nine months, I thought about that. That's how long it takes to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm not, you're right about it. Uh, here I was uh, pastoring a church, and I pastored Mount Zion by God's grace for yes, 37 years. 37 years. Yeah, we went literally from less than 100 members of a split church scenario to well over 5,500 in those 37 years with a lot of changes, a lot of growth, a lot of prayer, a lot of fasting, and uh, we had some impact in the community. Wow, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, so sir. My, my journey has been one that... Um, kind of flows in my family. My grandfather was a pastor, my dad, my uncle, I have two brothers who pastor. Probably have 20 cousins who pastor. Wow, so, runs yeah, in the family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> either that runs in the family, got a few of them who ruin the family, but that... <laughs> <laughs> Don't everybody, that <laughs> doesn't everybody. <laughs> uh, but it has been a tremendous journey and continues to be. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll say this at the very outset, because I'm not in the pulpit does not mean I'm doing ministry. Mm -hmm. I think there's a misnomer that people think that unless you're pastoring, yes. that you're not doing ministry. Oh, but yes. let me just tell you, anybody uh, who calls themselves a leader and has mm -hmm. nobody following them is just really on a walk. Yes. Because you gotta have some followers and Christ really didn't stay in the pulpit to do most of his ministry. Oh, it was in the marketplace. Yes, sir. And so that's really where we need to be. So uh, I, it was really just a great learning experience. And it was one of those things that, to be honest with you, yes, I really didn't want. Mm. I want yeah, I had, I had three choices uh, in, in my career choices. My first one was to be a trial attorney. Okay. I wanted to try cases and, you know, see justice. Yes, sir. Uh, the second thing, if it wasn't that, I wanted to be a great businessman. Mm -hmm. And if that didn't work out, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. That is funny. <laughs> So, so the Lord said, I'll teach you. <laughs> yeah, let, me, let me go ahead and swing you in the right direction. <laughs> that is funny. Well, listen, I'm, 
Y'all, I'm telling you, uh, me and Bishop, we had, Bishop and I, excuse me, we had a conversation just before uh, we started airing the show, recording the show today, and I'm telling you, I just got goosebumps because of the things that he was sharing, and already as he has uh, begun to minister, he reminded, Bishop, you reminded me of a nugget that I teach, and that is, that nugget is the difference between calling and purpose. Oh, yeah. A lot of times in ministry, when we preach and when we teach on that subject, we kind of join the two all together as if they're the same. Right. Actually, we understand the significance of the two because we understand that there's the difference between the two. Right. Both are important. So when we separate them and understand them separately, then when we marry them back together, can we truly get all that God wants us to get out of both? And so now that we're dealing and definitely want to touch the heart of leaders and members here on this show with Bishop being here, as he was talking, he reminded me of that nugget because we need to understand callings can change. Right. Absolutely. And they do. And they do change. Yeah, they do. And we need to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit for our individual lives to understand when God is calling them to change. I, I want to tell you, Pastor, what I, what I say that as a leader, you need to be so in touch with God yes, sir. that when he whispers, mm. you hear him as opposed to him having to yell Dude. at you. Oh, wow. Because, yes, uh, you know, one of his, one of, one of his uh, disciples mm -hmm. laid his head on his chest, yes, sir. John, and of course, uh, that was symbolic of hearing God's heart. Yes, sir. So we want to and need to hear the heart of God as opposed to try to determine where God is and then find out where he's going. Wow, hallelujah. Because oftentimes what we do in ministry is we tend to do something and then invite God in mm -hmm. to approve what we've done. That's it. Go ahead and speak on that, sir. <laughs> but the key has to be that if we're going to be followers of Christ, yes, sir. then we have to let him be in the lead. Yes, sir. And, and, and let me let me, let me me just uh, interject here real, real quickly. Yes, sir. One, one, one of the things about leading that's important, you got to know who you are. That's primary. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, if, if you don't know how you who you are, how are you going to lead other people? Absolutely. How, how can you lead somebody to Christ? I had a scenario a few days ago uh, where an individual was unsaved and another individual wanted to lead them to Christ and they were in a leadership position but didn't know how to do it. I, I, I think that's uh, just downright uh, unnecessary. Mm -hmm. If you are a leader, the one thing you got to know is how to lead people to Christ. And you got to follow the Holy Spirit in doing that yes, because it won't be in every presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, because there's somebody out there listening today who perhaps needs Christ. And you, you of course, know what you need mm -hmm. uh, in order to get that, what I call, transition in place. Hallelujah. But the truth of the matter is, uh, when somebody does in a rogue manner, in a, just a traditional manner to impress you, that has no effect on you. But let me just tell you, every person needs Christ. Yes, sir. There's a place in the life and the spirit of every person that's reserved for Christ. And if you don't give it to him, you give it to a false God. Yes. Wow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You give it to a false, <laughs> false God. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. And, you know, Bishop, you, um, as you mentioned earlier, too, there is a problem that you spoke of that's uh, that's the general norm mindset throughout uh, the our Christian faith and that is that you are not ministering unless you are in the pulpit and one of the things that I have done uh, and also uh, for those of y'all when you get a chance go and pull up we have a, a show called entitled professional pastors I want you to go and check that out and pray and hopefully that'll be a blessing to you as well we have um, Bishop Mason over in our south southeastern North Carolina there uh, and he, he and I excuse me did some ministry on that subject go and check that out on your spare time but Bishop you reminded me because you spoke to something and one of the things that God has called us to do is to experience more of God ordained leadership Right. We what we call a fivefold ministry there in the New Testament. We understand that there's five. Right now, we made them titles, but as I've talked before, they're labels. Right. But here's the thing that we need to understand: with the way that we have ministry, the way we've been trained in ministry, and different things like that, it has set us up to only experience twenty percent of God ordained leadership. Right. And right. that is the pastoral care right. model of what we have, you know, grown to think that to be. And what you spoke to of is that, and you mentioned that even in, uh, as you were given your experience, and now when you're walking into it's understanding God all of the ministry that you put in place beyond the pulpit because most of what we get or what we think is tied to is the pulpit if we think if we take the pulpit out of ministry there's no ministry happening but one of the things and that's why we're honored to have you here because of your position now having experienced that right. before you know during and now afterwards and now I know you have a different vantage point because you experienced all of them and that's why it's such a pleasure to have you today well let, 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 let me let me let me address the whole issue yes, of the 20% mm -hmm. I think because the pulpit is so public 
Yes, sir. That we invariably forget the private part wow. of ministry. Jesus. The reality of it is what we see manifested in the public mm -hmm. is only a minute part of what we have to do in private. It is true. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll give you an example. You know, you dress well today, mm -hmm. but that isn't your entire wardrobe. Yes, sir. You're right about it. <laughs> it's, it's, what I'm it's only a part. So when mm -hmm. I see that part, I can't, uh, I can't judge you or say that's all you are yeah. because that's all I see. That's good. Uh, but, but, but. But while that's a critical part and an important part, it's not the only part. Uh, and, and I've come to the conclusion that if I had to do my ministry over again, mm -hmm. the one thing I would do more of is raise up uh, and develop leaders and leadership. Jesus. Uh, and wow. the reason I would do that is uh, leaders are the people who go out in the community. They are the community. They're the people that get the word out. Our job, mm -hmm. biblically, is to train and prepare. Yes, sir. You're exactly right. But, but what we try to do is we try to take over the other part because our egos get massaged oh, from the Talk about it, sir. Yes, sir. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And so everybody wants that particular role. But let, mm -hmm. me, let me help you with something. Give, 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 give me a warrior. Give, give, give me somebody... Mm -hmm. Who prays someone who intercedes give mm. me somebody who is a profound teacher yes, sir. give me somebody who's prophetic give me somebody who knows God from a different perspective than the pulpit yes, because you know it's like this the things that are manifested in earth already happen in heaven and in the spirit realm yes, sir. and until we we can grasp that what we tend to do is we judge God by what we see but everything we see is temporary yes sir and so then everything we don't see then is permanent so my issue gets to be why are we making eternal decisions based upon temporary appearances wow that is a very good question wow I told you you guys would be blessed today Wow, that is a very good question. So what we have to do is we have to be mindful of the fact that as leaders, mm -hmm. as leaders, first of all, you have a responsibility. That is true. Yes, sir. You have a responsibility, not just to the people, but mm -hmm. to God. You have a responsibility <clears throat> uh, to promote truth and righteousness. Hallelujah. You have a, you have a uh, responsibility not only to promote it, but to live it. Yes, sir. Okay. Consequently, when you live it, there will be some fruit that are manifest in your life uh, because of your living it out. I've never seen a fruit tree that was truly called a fruit tree until it started bearing. Ah, that's good. So what we tend to do is we have offices and titles, but mm -hmm. we never bear fruit. And so my issue gets to be, why, why do we do that? And here's the reason and the rationale behind that. We do that to impress and to be impressed. It is true. But it never impresses God. God As a matter of fact, it breaks his heart. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I asked somebody the other day, <clears throat> uh, you, you're a Christian. My question is, uh, if you were another person, would you follow you? Mm. <laughs> I like that question. That's a very good question. If, if I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. if I'm a Christian, would I follow me knowing me? Mm -hmm. Boy, that gets to be a tough one. That is, man. You, that's one of the ones where you just sit in the mirror. That's a sailor moment. Oh, I just sit in the mirror and just, you just think about all the different things that, you know, come. Because that's that's a very important question. Yeah. Would I follow that would change. That would change things. Yeah. Would I follow really would. Because now, you know, in saying that, we understand that when you when we really look at it. And, and I posed this question before. <laughs> because you really want to get, the key thing is motives and motivation. Right, 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 and, right. And, I, and I've said this before. Uh. Motives can purify your life right. and, and, your, and your dealings and your doings. And one of the things is like, you reminded me, Bishop, like, what would ministry be like void of the financial aspect as right. well as the prestige aspect? Right, right, right. You know, because when I'm looking at biblical ministry, you know, of course, we know there was a threat for lives being in danger and different things like that. But you saw when we look at our Lord and how he walked, you saw his motivation and what it was and one of the things one of the key things that we teach about when we get to to uh the way that christ did ministry in our seminars and things one of the things that we say is that one of the things that made christ who he was is for two reasons his motives were pure and that was the thing that drove him as far as pleasing god and the father precisely and then the next thing was he didn't have a need to be needed 
Right. Which freed him up to be the most needed and important individual that ever lived. Yeah. He was just walking, being the truth in the light because he had an authentic motivation to minister and let heaven invade earth with what not only, look at this, not only what people heard him say, but with what they saw him do. Yeah, you know, I, I, I said to someone, while well, God blessed me to have a large ministry, and I thank him for that. When you look at Noah, mm. Noah preached 120 years, mm. and his primary message was, y'all need to get ready because it's going to rain. Mm. That was his primary message. And in uh, speaking that primary message, I can assure you there were other gatherings much larger than Noah. There were people who were more eloquent than mm. Noah. Yes, sir. Uh, there were people who could move the crowd, as it were, mm -hmm. more than Noah. But mm. when it came down to the bottom line, it was only seven others that got on that ark. You see mm. what I'm saying? So the eight of them. So the issue gets to be: it's not about the quantity, but it is about the quality. Oh my goodness! See, uh, t tell, tell, tell me, tell me, give me a Gideon experience mm -hmm. if I have to. T take away the thousands and give me 300 that will fight. Uh, someone rightly said, uh, uh, you give me 300 men and women of God who are sold out to him 100% and we'll conquer the world. We'll conquer the world. Because Jesus did it with 12. He did. He did. <laughs> he did. And, and so it was on that basis that I developed an acronym for the church while I was in ministry. And it's called CAFE. And you say, well, why CAFE? What, what do you go to a CAFE for? You go there to eat. Okay, so what does eating do? Eating gives you nourishment for the body. Yes, so the body can go forward. Yes, so then, in order for our body to go forward, I use this acronym, CAFE C. The C stood for Commitment and Communications. Mm. If you don't have commitment, right. you're not going to make any progress. Right. If you don't have communications, you're going to make progress and go be in the wrong direction. Okay, then you have the A. That's for accountability. Yes, Everybody has to be accountable to someone to include the leader. Absolutely. To, Say include, it again, Say it again. to include the leader. Jesus was a comp, uh, was a, accountable to God. Hallelujah. And then the Holy Spirit was accountable to Jesus. The disciples were accountable to Jesus. So the question gets to be, how do you think that you can run around, make decisions in a vacuum, and be accountable to no one? Ooh, my goodness. So then F is the follower. C-A-F, follow up. Uh, many times programs fail in the second go around simply because there was no follow up. Mm -hmm. You ought to be willing and transparent enough in any endeavor to look at the good, bad, and the ugly and say, we failed at this. What mm -hmm. do we do and what do we need to do? You know, <clears throat> if I come up and uh, I'm, I'm having people uh, become partners with us, covenant partners with us, and uh, they're going out the back door as quickly as they're coming in the front door, my question ought to be, what in the world is wrong? Yes, sir. Uh, now, I, I need to say this, and I need a minute to explain this. There are some things that the back door is good for. It's good for those people who don't belong under your leadership. Yes, sir. And please understand, that is so not good. everybody belongs under your leadership. God, say that again, Bishop. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make you a failure because someone comes and they leave, you know. Uh, there was Demas. He was out there, you know. There was Judas. I could go down the line of people who came who knew Christ. But let me tell you what Christ did. Christ took what was called the scum of the earth and used it to glorify <laughs> God. Hallelujah. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the prostitutes around him, the people of the world who were nothings, as it were. Even though the disciples had much to do, they were great workers. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just tell you, he, he used blind men. Uh, he used lepers. Mm -hmm. uh, he he lose, used people that the world did not particularly care for. If you want some good soldiers mm. uh, in your war, get some people who want to fight. Jesus. <laughs> not some people who want to be cute, and not some people who want a title, and not some people who want to lord over other people and don't have the lord over their life. Oh, my goodness. So so then you got to have uh, some follow-up. you got to go up, and you got to clean up some stuff that's messed up, and you got to be humble about it. got to be humble about yes, it. And finally, you got to expect excellence. The Lord never did anything that he didn't expect excellence. Even mm -hmm. when God passed him, uh, made the earth, he said, it's good. Then he come back to, whoa, wait, wait a minute, it's very good. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so the issue is mm -hmm. expect excellence because you're going to get what you expect. 
If you expect your child to be bad, you keep telling him or her that, that's what's going to happen. If you expect them to be good, to be godly, and you keep telling them that and showing them that, mm -hmm. that's what they'll become. Yes, sir. But pastor, you've got to expect good. It bothers me to no end mm -hmm. to go to houses of worship and it look like, you know, it's the leftovers from somewhere. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that, that it's a secondhand store or something. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. God deserves the best. Mm -hmm. He gave his best. Yes, sir. Uh, who was his son. And consequently, we ought to by all uh, possible means represent him well. Now I'm not suggesting that you have to uh, penalize the people to make you look good as a leader. Oh, stay on that. <laughs> stay right there. Stay on that. <laughs> That's a very <laughs> wow. But I wow. am saying what God does is decently and in order. Uh, for for an example, you mm. know, um, you, you you don't have to have uh, golden chandeliers. Uh, in your congregation or your building, your house of worship, but the bulbs you got ought to be all on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You shouldn't have burnt out bulbs and stuff. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you, you don't have to have uh, French made uh, commodes in the restroom, mm -hmm. but they ought to be clean. Mm -hmm. And it ought not be restricted to just one class or one group of people. Yes, sir. It ought to be. I, I have a philosophy that if it's in God's house and I'm God's child, it's my responsibility to make sure it's right. Mm -hmm. I pick up paper, mm -hmm. I move stuff, and you say, well, you know, I, I got somebody to do that. Well, you may have, but you may also be a better example by showing them how to do it so good. the next time you don't have to. You, yeah, Bishop, you are so, that is so good. That and, is so very good. And, and so I'm, I'm convinced that, uh, you know, when in fact, you're going to be successful for the kingdom. And success for the kingdom is not always measured by worldly standards. Please okay. understand that. Uh, you know, in the world in which we live, uh, we think people are successful who have the most toys. Mm -hmm. uh, That's but, true. But there are no slaves behind the hearse. Oh. Nobody takes the toys. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so, so my issue is, uh, God gives us or permits us. Somebody asked me the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had gone by the building that the Lord allowed me to build. Well, two of them. And uh, I said, man, we didn't, we didn't know you had all of this. I said, it didn't mind. Mm. See, when you understand that this thing is loaned to you. Yes, sir. When I came to Mount Zion, the pulpit was empty. Mm. And I told them I'll be here till God tells me it's time. And it'll be empty again till somebody else fills it. This is not a permanent position. Right. And one of the things that bothers me is many of our leaders, particularly pastors, uh, cannot afford to leave the pulpit because they've not made provisions mm -hmm. for God to take care of them after pulpit ministry. Wow. That's going to bless somebody, sir. Uh, the issue gets to be, <clears throat> and let's just be candid. There are some things I could do at 25 mm -hmm. uh, that I cannot do at 68. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I was the other day I was getting ready to do some little stuff with, and uh, took my body out there and I was getting ready to you know jump and climb the monkey bars you remember yes, I sir. Oh, yeah. yes, sir. I grabbed and went about five bars and my body said you better jump down <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for the warning. <laughs> said, said, if you want me to participate, you My better do that. <laughs> and so, while you understand that, mm -hmm. what you do is you build around you people that you pour into. My, my, my goal and my objective, and I tell everybody that knows me, anything I got about the kingdom, I'll give to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I can help you. Uh, grow your church if I can help you uh, structure it according to the will of God. Let me just say this. If you're growing a church and God has given you a ministry, don't think your ministry has to be like anybody else's. Oh, exactly. man. You, Bishop, you know what you just hit on? Because in, in one of the teachings um, that I did and, and I was able, God afforded me the opportunity, I was able to minister. That I was before uh, the leader. So, and you know, you can tell, you can sense um, that there's a lot of insecurity. Sure. And if you don't, which everything, everything should will out of knowing who you are. Right. right. You know, and that's one of the actually sub points that we actually talk. And so in that comes an identity that, listen, and I often say this, I said, don't let the outside dictate your inside. Right. But let you be so steadfast in your inside, knowing who you are, knowing what God has called you to do, that you go unyielded and unwavering until the outside yield to it. And even if it don't, you still remain who you are. And what I mean by that, Bishop, there's so many uh, leaders in the faith that 
they get so down because they don't, they can't, they ministry don't look like what they see on TV. And so they, I, I've actually seen, I've actually sat before them and they actually think it's a knock against something that they are or not doing. And they need to understand for one, what ministry is. And there are a lot of you all who are definitely consistent, could follow our ministry on a consistent basis. You've heard, just like what Bishop said, the exact quote in our presentation. When you did Jesus way, it was about what? Quality right. and not quantity in ministry. And when you look at how G Jesus did, who he poured into, who he made his life accessible to, mm -hmm. he got more things done in the spirit. Not because of addition, right. not because of multiplication, no. but exponential growth. And what we mean by exponential growth, all Jesus did was in essence, he made 12 more Jesuses. By what? Pouring who he was and what he had into them. You, you got to understand uh, that the math of Jesus isn't like the base two or the base ten math. <laughs> uh, say it, Bishop. You know, Jesus, Jesus uh, told us uh, that one plus one is one. He said, whoa, whoa, where is that? Uh, when one man mm -hmm. marries one woman, they become one. They become one person. <laughs> yes, uh, he takes two fish, five barley loaves, feeds 5,000 men and, and the women, whatever. Then he has an abundance of 12 baskets left over. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you take, you know, two and and five and and make it 12, 5,000? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Yes, sir. It's called Jesus math. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Jesus math, it doesn't make sense to the world. And that's what we got to understand. I like that. I, 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 I don't do things to please the world because when I please God, here's what God said even. He said, listen, man, if you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord mm -hmm. and you know I'll pay my debt. And so what I'm saying is whatever you give to God, do it in a godly manner. As a leader, if you don't have a giving spirit, you are not a leader. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave. gave. And all of us know John 3.16. Yes, uh, but what we don't do is we don't practice it. What we do is we want us for and no more. Mm -hmm. We want me, my, and us. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter, and here's what I've learned, Pastor. I, I, I've learned that in my life of ministry, uh, I used to give the tithe mm -hmm. but then, and, and an offering, mm -hmm. but then I, I doubled that. Mm -hmm. And when I doubled that, God doubled the resources mm -hmm. that were available to come in. I've never, ever suffered for giving God more. And, and same thing of myself, uh, even when I was exhausted sometimes and tired. And let me just throw this out there at some leaders. The devil uses fatigue to defeat you. Ooh. The devil uses fatigue to defeat us. Mm. You cannot function, Pastor, mm -hmm. uh, at a fatigued level and expect excellence. You cannot do it. Uh, I mean, even God, and, and he doesn't need rest. Mm -hmm. he, he did what he was going to do in six days. Mm. And then on the seventh, the Bible declared he rested. Yes, sir. Not that he was tired, but he understood uh, that we need to set aside time to let our bodies recuperate. Listen, you can push your body, push your body, and what you'll end up doing is being like me, having open heart surgery. Mm. Because you push too hard, you eat too wrong, you don't exercise enough, and then you want God to heal you. It's kind of like uh, people who uh, uh, pay $4 a pack for cigarettes, get cancer, then ask God to heal them, when in fact all they needed to heal them from it was not smoke it in the first place. Mm -hmm. I ain't not going to do what you do, but that's the truth of the matter is, is the truth. that's what is happening. It is the truth. And yes, so sir. what you got to understand is that when your body is tired, your spirit man is, is tied into your physical body. And so you got to give that body some rest. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, you know, there, there was a time uh, when we were growing at a, at a rapid pace where we did uh, six services in a weekend. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, people didn't understand why on Sunday after I finished the sixth service, I went home, parked in the bed, slept a while, got up and ate. Mm -hmm. I didn't take any evening appointments. I didn't take none of that because my body was Good tired. Work. And I That's know I make bad decisions when I'm tired. Wow. Bad decisions. That is so practical. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, many of the mistakes I made, it wasn't physical tiredness, it was mental tiredness. Mm. But let me help you even more. Yes, it sir. was spiritual tiredness because I had not invested the time to be reinvigorated in the word with God to yes, give sir. me the strength I needed. So what I relied upon was carnal knowledge that got me into the problems that God had to deliver me from. <laughs> Wow, Bishop, you know, as you, just so very practical, and therefore, you know, because 
that is one of the things that does fight, especially Christian leadership, yeah. is fatigue. Yeah. And, and now we need to ask ourselves, why are we fatigued? Right, right, right. Because one of the things that, that I teach as far as, like, when you go back even to the Bible says, don't be conformed to the ways of this Ooh, world. Right. And when you really look at that further, it really translates the ways of this age. age. And a lot of times, when, at first read, Bishop, we actually think that that really means sin. When at, in all actuality, it can include sin, but it really means is the ways of this age, the ways of this age is going. Things that sin and habitats that sin can live in and see what we need to understand our age our contemporary model mindset has told us get busy get busy get busy and so now what we have done just like christian leaderships like the world we have adopted the world's model and i like what you said jesus math is different we can get more done in six days than the world can in seven i'm reminded of the chick-fil-a Right. Man of God, they started that. Right. They closed. They were so powerful, they even told the malls, we don't care if everybody else stay open. We shall close on Sunday. And guess what? Chick-fil-A stay packed. And you know, sometimes, Bishop, I've been guilty. I go to Chick-fil-A on the Sunday and be like, oh, man, they closed. <laughs> but Bishop, you know you get convicted because you don't want to get too mad because you know yeah, yeah, why yeah, they closed. Yeah, 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 <laughs> but yeah. you want that waffle fry. But what I'm saying is, just like one of the things that Bishop Covey, and I want to go back and visit that because a lot of us in leadership, we can get, God can get more out of us if we unbusy ourselves. And I know it sounds, it sounds really, it goes against the grain. And I actually talked this to my people, it was last week or so. I said, we need to understand, and I was speaking to the business owners. I said, even as a business owner, one of the things, and I like what you said, Bishop, because I've seen it in my life, the more you give to God, even sacrifice a time to him where you could make money. Right. Not only does it preserve your help, but he will honor that because he sees the sacrifice. Let, let, let me say this two things. Yes, sir. Answer. One thing was, you know, I, I did say one of the things I wanted to be was a businessman. Yes, sir. And I own seven businesses. Mm. Uh, but here's what the Lord told me ultimately. Either you're going to serve me or you're going to serve those businesses. Ooh, that's a good word, sir. I, I don't have space for good both, word. both. And so it was then when I said, okay, God, you win. You know, I sold my businesses, every business I had, and the Lord ended up just giving me more than enough. Mm -hmm. Not only uh, did he give me what I need uh, in terms of resources financially, but he gave me, he gave me peace with it. Mm -hmm. See, when I was there in the other, other arenas, you know, I'm scratching my head, pulling my hair, trying to make this strategy work. And, and, and some of it did, of course, but the truth of the matter is I had real peace only when I came and did what God had formed me to become. Uh, he knew who I was in my mother's womb. What I didn't know was uh, who I was after I got out. Mm. So, <laughs> So what he had to do was teach me. Yes, sir. Now, there's nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, I love business. I absolutely love business. And in our congregation, you know, we have a multitude of business persons mm -hmm. that we promote, we encourage, and all that. But you got to give God his time. Give him his if time. you don't give God his time, what ultimately ends up happening is you give it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And self-gratification never pays in the long term. Wow, that's so good. Okay. That is so good. Now, now, now let, let, let me suggest to you also that while I was trying to do all of these businesses, you know, we're in the, we're in the business of multitasking. Yes, sir. I, I got a I got a statement, and somebody needs to hear this. Uh, you know, when you're multitasking, you never give a hundred percent to either one of those. Tasks. That is the truth, Bishop. It's impossible because if you gave a hundred percent, you couldn't do something else. So my question is, why will you set yourself up? to have do something mm. that you think ought to be a benefit to you. Mm. Let, let, let me tell you, let me tell you what my, uh, what my uh, secretary said to me. She said to me, and I'm through for today, Pastor, if you didn't have time to do it right the first time, where are you gonna find time to do it over? <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. <laughs> That is so true. And so uh, I, I've discovered that, you know, uh, an hour that I'm, and I, I love watching some sports, but, uh, you know, the hour I watch television, mm -hmm. what if I just meditate? What if I just talk to God? Mm -hmm. What if I just sleep? What if I just take time with the wife and the kids? What mm -hmm. if I just do something that glorifies God? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm of this persuasion and I'm through, I promise you. I, I, I've come to the conclusion mm -hmm. that if we're going to be as leaders who God has called us to be, yes, sir. three things we've got to do. 
we got to take self-analysis of who we are. Yes, we do. Number two, we got to be willing to make that being that God has called us to be mm -hmm. in alignment with his will, his word, and his way. Hallelujah. But number three, we have to pass it on to the next generation mm -hmm. without reservation. Yes, sir. We have to pass it on. And we have so, so try to drive that point home in this ministry. We have to pass it on because part of the part of the burnout, and we speak a lot about burnout, and uh, not only some Christian leadership, but just abroad, <clears throat> and part of that burnout, uh, Bishop, and, and, and especially with the, the calling and purpose teaching, we need to understand that purpose is the only thing that can measure true productivity and success in life, in life. not calling. Right. But here's the thing, you get burnt out when you want to try to measure success, generally speaking, by way of calling alone. So right. that it brings burnout because calling can never sing you the message when it's time to let up. Only purpose can do that. Right. And so one of the things that we submit to Christian leadership to kind of make sure, because we need to understand, calling without purpose is the formula for burnout. Right. Now if you switch it around, Purpose without calling is the formula for frustration. Right, right. Because you see the end, but the calling is what gets you there. You know what I'm saying? And so one of the things that I like what you said is that, for one, it is so practical to simplify our life. Right. You know what I'm saying? And 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 that is so key. And I'm so glad that you brought it down and pointed it out because it's we don't understand. The enemy fights us with a lot of indirect things. Right. He's very good at getting our attention over here. Just as long as he get it, and like you said, we don't give it our all. It's just as long as he get it, he got it. And a lot of things, a lot of times, it's not even the quote unquote big sins, but right. it's the indirect things that can take our energy away. Yeah. And so that's one of the things, and again, I hope y'all have been blessed. Bishop, what I want to do right now, I want to make sure I give you time also, because there's a couple of things that I wanted to hit on in this show. Okay. One of them you already touched on, okay. and that is the importance of dealing with leadership, the importance of um, accountability and leadership having a good support base on a consistent level. Statistically, we know that pastors and Christian leaders are among the highest uh, rate and group that has the least amount of closest friends. Now that caused a problem and that signals, that lets me know this, that pastors don't have an outlet. And one of the things that Bishop already mentioned in, in that cafe um, scenario that he gave us is that the importance of not only accountability and follow-up, and I like how you put that. So Bishop already explained it, and another thing that I wanted to end this segment with, and I want Bishop to touch on, is also another statistic that deals with polled families who have Christian leaders in them said that the worst day for their family was the day that they entered ministry. And so Bishop, what I want you to do, I want you to elaborate on the importance You've been in ministry, mega and small. Mm -hmm. And I, the importance for Christian leadership, because a lot of times, and I say this in, I think, the video that we call the family structure, how a lot of times when we get in ministry leaders, then we abort our family. Not understanding that because of Timothy and the, and the dynamic of ministry, that when we abort family, we run away from the chalkboard of ministry. And so what I want you to do, Bishop, just at the, for the importance of keeping family as priority, and again, and that, and that also ties right into not being so busy and tying up our time, getting time for rest. That all ties in together was what you already touched on. Could you elaborate too, sir, just on the importance of the family yeah. structure? Well, first of all, uh, the whole Christian walk is relationship based. Yes, it is. It's our relationship with Jesus and Jesus' relationship with God and the Holy Spirit. So relationship comes into play, but we have downplayed it. Mm -hmm and it has caused many, many problems. As a matter of fact, you know statistically, uh, the Christian divorce rate is high as non-Christian. Yes, that ought not be. It ought not be. Uh, secondarily, you understand that, and this may, this may upset some folk, that the church can become your God. Yes, sir. Okay? You're exactly right. And the fact that it becomes your God is you spend all your time, all of your energy, all of your effort mm -hmm. for that congregation as yes, opposed sir. to the uh, family that God gave it. Now listen, I just, I just mentioned a moment ago about the math of God one and one. Mm -hmm. God does not make a leader one uh, with that church or congregation. That is the truth. He makes it with a spouse. Yes. Okay? Oh gosh, you're so good. And, That's so and, good. And, Thank and, you. And in so doing, there can be people who come to the church every time the door is open mm -hmm. and have a ragged home life. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to translate into is rebellious children and a chaotic home. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give you my personal story. 
I grew up in Arrow, uh, and I told you my dad's a pastor. I drove him. And the reason I did not want to be a pastor was I saw how he was treated mm -hmm. uh, via the churches and the offices, et cetera, et cetera. And plus, they didn't make much money. I said, I just can't live my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's not <what> living. <laughs> But at any rate, um, I, I, I understood what was going on mm -hmm. and uh, how difficult it was, and you, you alluded to it a moment ago, uh, for my daddy to have what I would call true friends, close friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, there was always somebody trying to find something mm -hmm. uh, to throw in the glass house. Yes, okay? yes. And so, so I, didn't, I didn't want a part of that, but God knew what I was called to be. So what happened was when I started ministry, I came into a situation where it was a split church scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I used to tell people all the time, we couldn't afford uh, to buy toilet tissue on time. You know? mm. So it was just that bad. But uh, what we did was, you know, God gave us some principles, we put them into effect, mm -hmm. and we were able to overcome it. But the truth of the matter is, there was a lot of animosity, there was a lot of hatred, there was a lot of hurt, there was a lot of pain. So I spent the first three years of our ministry trying to heal people to see from God's perspective. Mm. Because here, here's what happened, mm. Pastor. Yes, sir. When, when, you, when, you look, when, you look, and when you look at your hand and there's a scar there, mm -hmm. it can remind you of what happened. But what you cannot do is let the scar remain raw. Mm. and bring pain yes, sir. it ought to be a source of god i got healed from it mm -hmm. rather than That's what goodness. happened to me right but see y'all you also got to know the difference between a scar and a tattoo mm. a tattoo you put it on your you city. put it on there <laughs> <laughs> okay yes sir i like that you put it there okay and and and, and so what happens uh, in that process mm -hmm. is I said, well, I want to I bring this church together. I want to heal this church. I want to make sure it's a viable, God-loving church. And so I spent, and I, I, I in, in, the, in, the, in the natural, I uh, was a workaholic, you know, mm -hmm. 20 hours a day wasn't unusual for me. Wow. Okay, so God had to teach me about that. Yes, sir. And that's another reason I can talk to you about fatigue. Yes, sir. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, God had to teach me about that. So my son was growing up and I had a daughter. And boys need daddies in their lives. Oh, you can say that again. Okay. And so here I was, and my son was growing up. He was about 14, 15 then at that age. And so he needed me there desperately. But I felt the church needed me. Mm -hmm. So there literally came a point in time where my son went into rebellion because I wasn't there to guide him. Mm -hmm. I was guiding the church. Yes. You know what I, I mean? A lot of pastors actually find that in their homes. Yes, sir. Yeah, but, let, but let me be the first to tell you, your, your marriage uh, is your first ministry, your children, your second then comes your congregation and whatever, of course. Yes, you know God's head of all of that. Mm -hmm. But the issue is, if you don't take care of your family, I don't see how you can call yourself a Christian leader. Mm. And so what happened to me was uh, he, he just started to get rebellious. And then... One day I got a call and uh, uh, he was crying and some stuff had happened in his life. And uh, I said to my leaders, from this day forward, whenever a phone call comes in from my wife or my children, I don't care where I am, I don't care what I'm doing, you come get me right then or somebody's going to be in serious trouble. Mm. Because if it were you and your whatever you were doing, you wouldn't want me there. My, I'm going to take care of my family. Yes, sir. A man who will not take care of his own is worse than an infidel and has yes, lost his faith. That's the and your family is part of your faith. It is. Because it's extended and it's developed there. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And if you don't have it in your family and in your home, you, again, you can't be a godly leader. But at any rate, the family becomes so so critical that in the whole uh, uh, flood scenario, who didn't know a say but his family? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And Abraham, where did the lineage begin if not his family? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying to you, family was so important to God that in the beginning, it was he who instituted marriage. It was he. And so he says, look, I know it's important. Mm -hmm. So you got to know it's important. If you think, if you think, if you don't believe it, ask some, some of the well-known preachers. If you think getting engagements, being on the preaching circuit, mm -hmm. if you think all the bling bling and all the other stuff and Bishop, will we, substitute. And, and Bishop, <laughs> that, that right there, you keep going, but I just want to interject right there because those that now you are listing is what the, is what the pastor in our culture 
screen for. They right. want their they want to get full up, say that I'm going here, I'm flying here, they go ministry, they they want their schedules full with engagements. And just as you were going down the list, those are the things that insecurity for one breeds because you are still a man of God without those, whether they come or not, but they they, they are thirsty for those things that you name. But go ahead, Bishop. What were you saying? <laughs> and so and so, you know, you, you want to keep your calendar full and mm -hmm. you want your iPad and your iPhone and everything booked up. But the question gets to be, how about the family? Jesus. You know? Yes, sir. Because here's the deal. When everybody else deserts you, guess who's going to be there if you've treated them in a godly manner? Family. Family. Guess who's there on those lonely nights and when the bills need paying and when other stuff is going wrong and when you're not getting a majority uh, approval of what you're doing and when uh, the devil raises his head? Who goes with you through that? Mm -hmm. The church never sees that. Yes, and so you got to have family. Here's, here's, what, here's, what I, here's what I do. I say that family is like an island. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there, there, there's plenty of water and stuff around me, mm -hmm. but I get all my food, my nourishment and stuff from off the island. Mm -hmm. Anything's imported, I may take it. Even the sharks are out there in the water, but on the island, on the island mm. is where I find peace and tranquility. Wow. If you don't have a place called home ah. that you can go to, Jesus. you are most miserable. Jesus. And you know, Bishop, what that does... And, and I like how you put it because you hit on it some minutes ago when you said God doesn't join a leader to the church. Mm -hmm. He joins a leader to his what? His family. family right. And y'all know me. I love talking about marriages and right. the importance of marriages and family. Y'all know me if y'all been following us for any length of time. And, and I just taught this, I think it was Sunday of not loose past and the one before that to some people. And I was saying, sharing this. You need to understand the importance of how you honor. Now, I'm speaking to the spouses and the married folk now because... One, let's go back to reasons why we've gotten to this place okay. where where we mar where we want to be married to the church more than home. Couple of reasons why. One of the reasons is that now we set up to where the church is where we get all our affirmations. Right, 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 right. And so now spouses, this is what I'm telling you, wives, you can close the door because it might not be your fault, but you can help shut the door and give a solution by making sure that nobody affirms your husband or your leader, your person, more than you. Make sure if they ever get affirmation anywhere, they get it at home. And now leaders, it's also your responsibility to make sure that whatever affirmation they try to give you, because people, you know, naturally we, we adore those that do good things right. for us or that minister to, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is your responsibility to make sure that that's not tied to your heart. You channel that to God and know where your true affirmation comes from, because you are truly somebody if you're somebody in the house. And don't wait for Mother's Day and birthday oh, say to that. do all of that yes, stuff. Sir. Yes, Let me sir. tell you, we've been married 46 years, my mm -hmm. wife and I. And uh, I'm not bragging, but I am. Uh, it's something to brag about. How many years? How many 46. Years? 46 years. Uh, and uh, any given morning, she'll bring me breakfast in bed. Ooh. In bed. Mm. And I sit there. And eggs taste better. Does eggs taste better? I, 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 think I, can, bed. I think I can hear the rooster crow. <laughs> And and it's not it's not it's not one of those male chauvinist things. Right. It's what she wants to do. Honor. Uh, yeah, and, and and let me just tell you what though, but when she does that, partner, please understand anything that girl wants. You trying to make it happen. Yeah, I try to make it happen. Especially within reason. You know, she get a couple hundred thousand dollars, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Take a little love in it. But, but but the issue gets to be, guess what happens to my kids? Mm. They see what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, guess what happens to my nieces and nephews when we go to gatherings and we talk about it? Guess what happens to the people in the church when they see what happens and they say, I don't get breakfast in bed. In marriage, it's never ever 50-50. Mm -hmm. It's always 100-100. Right. That's right. And if you don't do 100-100, you're being unfaithful to your marriage. Mm, that's good, sir. And so uh, what I found out is that family is so important. When I was ill, who was there? My family, mm -hmm. my kids, my wife, uh, those who love me. Uh, when I was doing well, who was there? My mm -hmm. family. So you're right. If other people, to include the church, are affirming me more than my family, 
there's either something wrong with me mm -hmm. or something wrong with them mm -hmm. or something wrong with both of us. That's right. Because that's not the way of God. Right. And naturally, we always tend to, just by natural yeah. means, whether you save or not, you always tend to gravitate towards the area where you're receiving the most, most gratification yeah. and from. And so we need to understand. That's why it's important, especially, you know, in the family, in the, excuse me, the family dynamics and make sure that we actually, you know, keep those things because it can safeguard us from a lot. And like you said, what is it going to do to kids who come up in a home where they see mama and daddy good engagement and loving on one another because let me know let me let you all know this we need to discern the difference and understand the difference between those who love you for what you can do for right, them right. and those who love you simply because you are who you are right. those who love you regardless of your mistakes and they can see that's your family those in the home because guess what if they can still love you even with your life at home because like you said when you behind the pulpit you put on the show mm -hmm. But when you at home, you are who you really are. And if you still have a people who can love and adore you for that, hence your family, that's where you need to see and judge. That's where the edification and everything comes. I am somebody if I am somebody at home. At home. i tell you one of the saddest uh, testimonies I ever heard. I heard a little girl say one day, um, her dad was preaching. Mm -hmm. She said, I really wish I had that man at home. Oh, my God, that's sad. That's and that's an epidemic, bitch. Yeah. We see that in ministry. And, and, and mega or small, yeah. we see that fine line, you know what I'm saying? In that, and, and get this, I do want to make mention this too. Let me to minister to you, your leaders. Understand this. The best way to display love is not money spent. Right. It's time spent. Time spent. That's it right. is time spent. You are still considered a deadbeat right. father if you send a check in the mail. And I've said this at the Uprising Seminar. You are still considered a deadbeat father if you send a check every month. Send it on time. But there's no engagement between you and your child. Understand, the highest order of love is not money given. Right. It is time spent. There are people who don't have a lot of money, but they got their daddy or their mother, and it's appreciated. But you have rich people or millionaires who would give them what they want, but it's never there. We ca I came from a farm, very poor. As a matter of fact, you know, we were tenant farmers at one mm -hmm. time. But I can tell you what, the greatest experience I've ever had in my life mm -hmm. was not when I traveled, not when I helped build the church, not when I did some of the other things that are considered great. Yes, sir. It was the day that my mom and my dad affirmed their love for me when they said, son, we're going to send you away to college. We don't have any money to give you, mm -hmm. but our prayers are going with you. Wow. And they sent their prayers, and uh, I was a little bit entrepreneur. My mom would cook chocolate cakes and mm -hmm. bring them to me, mm -hmm. and I'd cut them in slices, sell them for a dollar slice. Uh, mm. and <laughs> I'd like to call it chocolate cake. <laughs> I know you But my point, my point is that the day they did that, mm -hmm because we didn't have much and I was the first to go to school and uh, college and so they they gave me love man mm -hmm. they gave me enough love to uh, enable me to overcome the money that some of the other kids had wow that's so good and and so the issue became that when I uh, when I got ready uh, when the Lord called me to ministry mm -hmm. uh, the first person I wanted to know was who my dad mm -hmm. the first person who affirmed me was my dad and if there's anything I've ever wanted in my life other than what God has given me is a fact I wish, I always wanted my dad to be my visitation pastor, but he Jesus. went home to be with the Lord before that happened. But I can flat out tell you uh, that love is much greater. Time is much greater. Uh, it's much more important, much more significant than things. Yes, sir. Things are made by man mm -hmm. to entertain. Love is made by God to retain. Yes, sir. Wow. I like how you put that. And time is not redeemable. And it's not redeemable. You can't go back and lose yeah, that yeah, and yeah. Get, regain that 20 years right. that you've lost right. while you was, quote, unquote, in ministry or doing ministry and neglecting the family home. Listen, I'm again, I'm so very elated and excited because I understand, I do know, I look, I'm look. i looking forward to how this show, this episode, which is called, and I didn't even give the name of the episode, Been There, Done it. Nah. <laughs> With the one and only Bishop, George Brooks Bishop. Bless it you, it has been a pleasure, sir. Man, and, it's and, my and, pleasure. Oh, man, my just pleasure. to, those of y'all who have been following this ministry, you know as he was talking, if you anything like I was, you was like, 
Man, that's so point there. That's so <laughs> point there because those are key things that we want to try to heart because we want to be a blessing. And in order to be a blessing, we truly know. We truly know it's just the truth. There are some things in ministry that we can do to change to be more effective and spiritually efficient. Right. And until we get those right, we know we know understand that flesh don't like change. Right. right. But our God, we read a Bible. We read a God who endorsed change. Mm -hmm. The same God that led our our brother to that brook. The same God told him to lead the same brook that he instructed him to go. Right. Why? Because change in life is needed, especially in the church. And so with Bishop Brooks here, we just pray that some seeds of wisdom we know have been sown. And, I, and I'm glad to get him here because I know his vantage point. He, he know life before the pulpit. He knows life while the pulpit. And now he knows life after the pulpit. The way he can be able to go back and speak of the things that he saw and the things that he have actually done. So, again, Bishop, we definitely appreciate you Thank here you. on the Kingdom's Perspective and, and definitely value your time being with us. Thank you and God bless you. God bless you again, sir. Right. Listen, we, again, we want to encourage you. Go back to our YouTube channel and look at our other episodes. And, again... Thank you. Call us, write us if you have any questions about anything presented here on the show. We will definitely indeed try to even answer those on the show. Until the next time, remember around here, we are married to the truth. I'm your host, Andrew Crawley Jr., Bishop George Brooks. God bless and we'll see you on the next time.